Ladies and gentlemen, Campbell Newman and Will Shackle. The new generation of new people. Well, why don't we start with, yeah. you know, who are you? How old are you? What are you doing? And then we might get into, well, how did, how did you get on this journey to do this? And you might sort of remind me about how we mm. sort of met online, I suppose. <laughs> Not in any sort of creepy way, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, thank you very much for having me, everyone, and Campbell as well for agreeing to interview me. It's an interesting story, and I'll get into how I stumbled across nuclear energy, but pretty much my name is Will Shackle. I'm a Year 11 student. I go to Churchy uh, on the south side of Brisbane, and uh, I think that's probably all you need to really know about me is I'm like any other Year 11 student, any other 17-year-old who's just somehow found a real passion for nuclear energy. In terms of how I came across nuclear energy, because it's not something most 17-year-olds, uh, especially in Australia, are aware of, especially because of the fact that, you know, we don't learn about nuclear energy in school. Pretty much I stumbled across it in a school assignment, I think back in primary school. I learnt about it again doing another assignment in grade 10 last year and then given that I had the school holidays and the time available during, over the Christmas break, I decided to research a topic which I found really interesting a bit more. I reached out to people online, including Campbell clearly, uh, experts from around the world and I think that really solidified my view that nuclear energy was an option that Australia should seriously consider. And I think the main thing for me which intrigued me so much about this topic and this subject area is the fact that Australia is one of the only nations in the world to ban nuclear energy and that just simply baffled me because regardless of, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm a 17 year old, but I just don't think it, would make, it makes any sense that Australia would be restricting itself from a technology that when you look to around the world and that's what my findings over the holidays were able to show, uh, could be really promising for Australia, especially in the context of the energy and climate crisis, which many young people are very well, much aware Well, I want to of. ask you about that, and I particularly want to get to the grips with this whole thing about the ban. Mm. So you reached out to me, when was that again? Just refresh my memory, was it back at the, it feels like it was last January. year, was it January? This I think year, was it was it? either December yeah, okay. or January. So, so just ladies and gentlemen, Will reached out to me on LinkedIn, um, and I think it was you said, I've got this petition, would you please you know, get behind it yeah. and then repost it. So I did. And I think then the only other thing I really did, for, I can claim I did for you, is I think that's when we got, got you on uh, Sky News Chris with Kenny. Chris Kenny. Yes. So what's happened since then? What are the things oh, you've been doing? <laughs> Geez, there's quite a bit that's happened, but I think it's, it's thanks to everyone who you know, responded to my LinkedIn requires in my emails that I'm able to get to the position where I am now. And I'm, I'll just preface everything I'm about to say by saying that I'm hugely grateful for all of the people who've shown support to me. But uh, from, that, from that moment with Chris Kenny, obviously I've done a quite a bit of media. The next immediate step was I made a submission to a parliamentary committee investigating the ban on nuclear energy. And as a result of that submission, I was invited uh, to speak, at a, speak to that Senate committee and to provide evidence live in Canberra, and that was in around May. And as a result of that, I did quite a bit of media talking you know, with Sunrise, a current affair later. And I think at that moment, I re really started to realise the true potential uh, of what I was able to do, because obviously the nuclear energy debate really isn't covered that much. There isn't really much of a platform for the nuclear energy debate. And to think that I was a 17-year-old who really didn't know much about nuclear was afforded such a platform uh, to advocate for something I be so strongly believed in, I think was really invigorating for me. So from, from that, I've, I've done a few things. Obviously, in the background, of, I'm running a social media campaign, Nuclear for Australia, where I'm reaching, I would say, quite a few people uh, across those social media channels, in particular young people, who I find have a real keen interest in nuclear, and I know we can discuss that later. And then, I guess, in terms of more specific things I've done recently, of course, I've been on Q&A twice in the past three months, which has been an interesting experience, because really it's the first moment for me where I've been able to take uh, the nuclear debate and uh, to you know federal Labor ministers because they're currently the ones who are getting in the way of lifting the ban and they're the ones who are basically maintaining uh, the, the anti-nuclear policies in this country. So that's been a real interesting experience. The other thing I, I, I missed was around the time of 
providing standard evidence. I did send the Prime Minister a letter, and obviously I don't expect a response, but I eventually got one from one of his department officials. And I, I, I guess everyone can assume what that, what that letter contained and the tone of that letter. Um, I don't think it would come as any surprise. And you know, peop I can direct people to my, my website, nucleofaustralia.com, if they wish to read that. But there's a few interesting things um, in that response, and I might just take a moment to yeah, explain. Yeah, because I, think it, I think it's really, we'll it's, really in, in, it's really interesting because I think the government is finding it more and more difficult to justify their anti-nuclear position when you look at things like AUKUS, etc. But I f found it particularly interesting the line in that letter where they basically said that the Australian government serves to reiterate the role that nuclear energy can play globally in reaching net zero. And at that moment. <laughs> It really clicked for that's, me. That's, so it, there's there's literally inbuilt it's, contradiction it's, in the letter you got back from Prime Minister and Cabinet. I, I thought that was quite profound yeah. that they were going to write back to me and concede the role that nuclear energy would have. So at that point, um, and I, I think there's so many examples of contradictions, whether it's the Orca submarines where the government is willing to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on small modular reactors and it's prepared to manage the high level waste associated with them, but not even willing to consider lifting the ban on land based small modular reactors. That's another contradiction. It's just contradiction after contradiction. Um, and for a 17 year old, I just it, it just makes no sense to me. Okay, well, there's a few grey-haired people in the room and people with no hair. Uh, they would say that, get used to this when you... I mean, I, I'm not going to make an assumption yeah. about your political affiliations, no. by the way, because I think this is across yes. across the left and the right these days. And I'm sure maybe you can reflect later yeah. on perhaps people from the Labor Party or even the union movement who may have sort of engage with you on this whole thing. I think there's a guy in Sydney who's a civil engineer originally, can't remember the guy's name, who was quite helpful for me when I had to do a speech about nuclear energy last October. There's quite a few of them. Yeah, yeah. but he, he's quite proudly and openly says I'm a Labor voter, mm. but he's pushing as well. But look, just in a nutshell, what's your objective? What, what do you want out of this campaign that you're spearheading? Well, if you look at the petition and what I'm currently saying, it's really clear for me that the ban on nuclear energy has to be lifted because that's the first step and the precedence from an action like that is really quite profound. Well, can I just interrupt? Yes. Because I'm going to do, oh, I'm I'm gonna do a Kerry O'Brien now or, you know, someone yeah. one of those mad lefties on the ABC. I'm going to interrupt a lot. Mm, no, um, all good, I'm all sorry, good. Just, <laughs> um, just, tell, just expand yeah. all this, just explain to people because some people may not understand that's important, where yeah. the ban sits and where the ban, how it came to be. Yeah, no, I think that's important um, because I only realised this quite recently and that's really when I got into my campaigning for nuclear energy. But uh, first of all, it's important to understand that there's not a single ban, there are multiple bans. There are many at state, at the state level. You know, there's one in Queensland and that also extends re more recently to uranium mining, but basically in every state and territory, there are bans on basically constructing a nuclear reactor. But what I'm specifically focusing on is the federal ban and there's some important context to that because I think the point is if we can get the federal ban lifted, there's huge precedence from that and hopefully all the states and territories would follow or at least I would be pursuing them after, <laughs> after the ban, that, that federal ban was lifted to get them to do that. But specifically in regards to the federal bans, they were, there's two of them, so it's, it's a bit confusing and I haven't fully got my head around it because I'm no politician, I don't really understand legislation. But they were both introduced in the late 1990s, around 1998, 1999. They're in uh, the Radiation Protection Act and there's another in the Environmental Biodiversity and Conservation Act. They were actually introduced under the Howard government, which is important, so it's not actually Labor Party policy which I think is interesting. It was never taken to the people. But it was never an election issue, really. People, at least from my understanding, I wasn't alive, at, of course, at that moment. Um, but people, it, for such a piece, consequential piece of policy, people never really got to have their say on it. Um, and the last thing is to really point out that it was a, basically a political compromise, a trade-off for getting the GST and also uh, funding for our research reactor at Lucas Heights, managed by Ansto, around 30 kilometres from the Sydney CBD. It was a negotiation slash trade-off to work out and negotiate the funding for that. So when you look at it through that framework, at least, the 
the message is that you know the nuclear energy ban was never good policy. It was never really well considered. I've heard, I've, I've even heard that for one of the bans, it was discussed overnight in Parliament and debated for about ten minutes. And when you think about it in that context, surely, surely, um, I'm happy to be convinced, really, and either way. But when you've got such a consequential piece of policy which is just completely ruling out a technology which has been proven around the world to help countries get to net zero and to provide clean, reliable energy, surely there'd be some extra consideration put into that when you consider the, what I would imagine uh, the, the effects of that in exacerbating the energy and climate crisis which my generation is now having to really so, understand. So on that, we'll just, just on, on the whole thing here. So. Your position is particularly that this is about dealing with net zero. So, like, I'm a, mm. I'm a yeah, climate no. change skeptic. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a net zero uh, sort of opponent, mm. uh, but I'm a believer in sustainability, and you know, I, I'm a big supporter of nuclear. So yeah. I come at it from a different direction. But for you, this is about go, going to a low carbon economy. That that's that's it. There there is that element, but also the fact that I think at least from my sense, you know, my generation is not going to be returning back to fossil fuels anytime soon. So if we want to be able to keep the lights on, then you need to consider solutions like nuclear. And it's, it could even be a compromise. I, I understand that some people might not have the same views in regards to climate change, and I completely appreciate that. Um, they probably come from a, a, from a much more informed perspective than I do, because obviously in the education system, we are taught one side of that story. But I think in terms of net zero, it, it doesn't have to be much of a challenge. It doesn't have to be that scary uh, if we have a solution like nuclear. I guess it's just an additional benefit of nuclear energy that it is zero emissions, that it's not emitting stuff into the atmosphere. And I think that anyone can agree that that's you know, probably a good thing. But the important point to make is that net zero doesn't have to be that difficult with nuclear because the fact is the only nations around the world which have major economies around the world have, which have been able to reach net zero have either used large amounts of hydro or large amounts of nuclear. There's no nation around the world which has been able to do it with a renewable-centric approach, a 100% renewables plan, which our, gov our current government is currently pursuing. And I think the point I'd make about that is, you know, Australia shouldn't be a guinea pig in this experiment. We shouldn't be running the risk, especially because if, the ris if, this, if this big bet, I guess, doesn't work, then it fails for my generation and the consequences of that could be disastrous. So I think the point I'm always making is that we should have all options on the table uh, in reaching net zero because it looks like that's you know the, the path that most politicians are at least pursuing and I think the path that we personally as a nation should be going down. Um, but if we, are, if we are going to commit to net zero, then at least we should be open-minded about nuclear. So, well, here, here, absolutely. Um, but of course, every time you know, I, I, I see someone like you putting this forward, of course, um, Chris Bowen says, and even the Prime Minister says, mm. well, it's not economic. It doesn't stack up. And uh, of course, we'll, mm. we know that renewables are the cheapest form of electricity. So how, how does this happen? How does this work? I mean, renewable, renew, well, well, okay, right now, I can tell you if we went onto the AEMO website, if it was working, because it wasn't earlier on today, not with my app, we would have seen that the price of wholesale electricity right now is minus $45 a megawatt hour. Oh, and it has been since about 8.30. It's quite sunny It will sunny be till today. 5 p.m. because all that solar is there. So if you do have a battery, literally they're paying you to take the money. They, they take that money to store the energy. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing won't stack up, mate. I mean, that's, that's it. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm Chris Barr. I know. You're, you're poor, um, misguided young chap. I mean, uh, no, come on. What well, do you got to say to that? Well, the first argument I'd make is that the cost of nuclear energy has nothing to do with the ban. And it's, you know, people might think Absolutely. it's ludicrous that I'm actually... Because people might think it's ludicrous to say that the government is actually using the cost of nuclear energy to justify their ban, but the fact is that they are. It's literally stipulated in their own Senate committee report, which, and I was involved in that Senate committee, as I mentioned earlier, but that is one of the eight reasons that they have. The others are like, nuclear energy isn't right for the grid, nuclear reactors take too long to build. Like, even if all of that was true, then why keep a ban on nuclear energy? Because no one would be silly enough to build a nuclear reactor in Australia. Of course, we know the opposites. Yeah, of course, we know the opposite's true when you look to see that 50 nations around the world are considering nuclear energy. But back in terms of the economics, um, I'd make a, 
an, another, I've, I've said this, it's sort of a joke, but you know, if you were banning things because they're too expensive at that point, you'd ban Snowy Hydro 2, you'd ban solar panels back in the day, you'd ban Teslas, you'd ban Gucci handbags. So it might sound like really <laughs> absurd and ludicrous, um, but like that, that's, a, that's, that's how I view it at least. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do that, but okay, in terms of the, uh, forgetting the ban, um, I'm of course of the belief that nuclear energy would be economically viable. You see that in the fact that so many nations around the world are investing in nuclear energy and there's huge levels in, of investment, particularly in new technologies such as small and micro modular reactors from really well established businesses like Rolls-Royce, Westinghouse, uh, G Hitachi, which are realising potential for nuclear. Well, well, well on that, yeah. then, then I'll do my interruption. Yeah, all good. So let's go straight oh, to thanks. let's go straight to SMRs. Yeah. I mean, I I, I have heard about this. That, that chap I talked about in Sydney, and mm. I had a good chat on this online. Um, but I put to you what again Chris Bowen would put if he was here now. He'd say, well, look, they're they're not actually there. They're just on the drawing board. They're still a concept. They haven't been mm. proven. What do you say to that? Well, that, that is true to a certain degree. Um, but the point I make is that I'm not, I, I just support lifting the ban in general to mm. consider all nuclear technologies because the fact is small modular reactors are nothing new. They're just, in most cases, uh, if you look to the AP1000, and because it's an important example, so basically Westinghouse has got a nuclear reactor which is called the AP1000, it's 1000 megawatts and they've recently announced the AP300 which is 300 megawatts and they've basically just condensed down the technology to, to basically be able to name it a small modular reactor. But the point is, I think, and you can see it from that, is that small modular reactors are nothing new. They're basically just condensing down the technology from large reactors which we know inherently works and provides clean, reliable uh, power. So the Whilst there are, you know, except in China and Russia, as you know, Chris Bond will say, those are the only really commercial ones. If you're ignoring, you know, the small modular reactors in our in submarines and ships so, and so stuff on like that. that. So, yeah, so sorry. Well, on that, yeah. I've got to jump in. So, has has Chris Barn ever publicly been able to acknowledge the inconsistency? He says they don't exist, but we're about to buy a whole lot that happen to come in a sort of a metal tube and will be underwater a lot of the time? Is that, um, isn't that an SMR in a way? Oh, well it is and the point I'd make is that, oh, and I, I know I made this earlier so I won't repeat that point to too much of an extent, but I don't think he has acknowledged that contradiction and you know I, I certainly have taken it to him. One politician who has to a certain degree acknowledged that contradiction is Peter Malinowski, Peter Malinowski sorry, in South Australia who's of course a major supporter of uh, the Orca submarine announcement for obvious reasons, but it's interesting how, and, and I'm diverting off to another tangent here, how he is actually open to the idea of civil nuclear power and he got quite a bit of pushback when in the media he vocalised his support for nuclear power. Um, but I think it's, it's becoming increasingly clear that it's untenable for the government to maintain a ban on land-based nuclear reactors whilst literally having to make provisions in that same legislation, uh, manufacture their own loopholes to justify uh, legalising these AUKUS, these small modular reactors, which just are, I so, guess, in so, the ocean. So let's go back to this issue about cost. Yes. Would you yeah. like to talk about if 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 we deployed SMRs, or the, mm. assuming the ban's gone, how would they be deployed, and and what is the true issue in terms of saving us money uh, in, in terms of the overall electricity supply system? Honestly, I've no idea how they'd be employed. So I don't, and I don't think it would be reasonable for me to basically be suggesting, you know, where would we put these uh, reactors? What what fuel types would we be using for the reactors? What coolants? You know, all of that sort of things. I think, and I, I don't want to be going back to the ban all the time, but I think I'll just say, you know, lift the ban to consider those things. I think I might just go off um, and discuss the Gen Cost report if you're okay yeah, with me for, for your doing that in terms of the economics of nuclear because currently it's an important context that when the government says that nuclear energy is the most expensive form of power, basically what they're referring to is the Gen Cost report which was commissioned by the CSIRO, so obviously it's you know very credible organisation but I think 
there are multiple issues with that which I can go into um, and there are some other people I can also point people to if they want to learn more about this issue but basically there is a there is this single report which is the government is pretty much holding up to justify uh, their opposition to nuclear energy at the moment and it's a report which has many flawed assumptions some of the assumptions just you know make no, no sense if you look back into the later pages of that report, it says they estimate the lifetime of a nuclear reactor to be 30 years. And they have the same estimate for solar, solar farms or wind turbines. So they've inflated, they've inflated the estimates for the renewables, but they have, they, the, the number of 30 years for nuclear reactors, as anyone would know, is just <laughs> incredibly low, when in reality, nuclear reactors can last for 60 or up to it a century, 60 years, or up to a century long. So there's, you know, there's minor things in there which I think would just lead you to the perception that it's a biased report and it's trying to uh, produce a desired outcome for the government. Um, but there are other things like the fact, and the, the CSI row and also AEMO acknowledges it, this, they don't see it as an issue, and this is something that Aidan Morrison, who people might know from Twitter, as, has done a lot of work in exposing is the fact that uh, the, the, in, in this report, the Gen Costa report, which, like I said, the government's using to justify their anti-nuclear position, they don't actually consider the costs of all of the transmission and all of the storage projects required from now to 2030 in their 2030 costings for renewables. And I think the analogy I'd make to, for this to make more sense is it's like they're pricing the cost of a building um, assuming that they've already paid for the foundations. So they're not actually factoring in the cost of the foundations for that building into the cost of the, the end product, which is basically the case we're having now with renewables. And what does that foundation basically, what does it look like? Well, it looks like Snowy Hydro 2. That's not factored into the cost, even though we know that's costing billions of dollars and there's cost, significant cost overruns in that. You know, major transmission projects like HumeLink aren't actually factored into the cost of renewables. So I think there's, there's, there's certainly, it's really easy to make the case that the cost of renewables has been, is in terms of this report, is significantly lower than what it would actually be in reality. And it's when considering those things like storage and transmission that the true cost of renewables becomes evident. But then there's that also that other face of it where the cost of nuclear energy has been incredibly inflated, whether that be from the, uh, I would say, ludicrous um, lifespan assumption or the fact that they're using numbers uh, for nuclear reactors because, of course, they don't really have any numbers to use in Australia. They're using numbers from an international report from back in 2015, so eight years, numbers which are eight years old, which have actually since been updated to show a significant, a significant cost uh, a cost reduction in nuclear energy. And the last thing I'd say, and I, I hope all of this makes sense, because it is quite a confusing subject and one I've certainly had to get my head around, specifically in terms of how they overinflate the cost of nuclear, is in terms of the CSI row costings in this gen cost report, the only nuclear technologies they actually cost are small modular reactors, when most evidence points to the fact that larger reactors are economically viable, and from my position at least, uh, large reactors are not something that Australia should exclude uh, from our energy mix if we were to, you know, say, lift the ban on civil nuclear power in so, Australia. So, so look, um, have you, in the course of this whole thing, had a good look at other countries, say, for example, Finland or France or now what's even happening in the UK? Mm. And is that, is, is that sort of, is that sort of uh, stuff that's going on there going to be instructive for Australia at all? I, I honestly don't know. I think that the connection with other countries, because there's around 32 countries around the world which use e nuclear energy, and it's no surprise that many of them are really developed nations like Australia, so you know, UK, China, United States, United Arab Emirates. The thing I think we can learn from our international partners is, first of all, if that the fact that um, they've done a lot of the work for us, and we theoretically, from my understanding, would be able to purchase reactor designs off the shelf. And that's something that you know, in the United Arab Emirates uh, they've done recently, where they're now producing 25% of their electricity from nuclear. They're basically 
purchased nu four nuclear reactors from South Korea off the shelf and have been able to construct those and establish an industry in less than a decade, which I think is a, an example that Australia should look to. So there's that one element, I think, in terms of uh, the international context of nuclear. But there's another important one. If, if Australia was to become a true nuclear nation where we're producing electricity from civil nuclear power reactors, uh, we would have a real potential to help out partner nations around us, especially uh, in the Pacific, and help them realise their potential and power themselves from nuclear. And it's interesting, the fact that so many Pacific Island countries are considering the option of nuclear, like Fiji, Philippines, there's, there's a few of them. Um, and, and I hope I'm not, I hope all of this makes sense, but the fact is that Australia already does have the foundations to be a incredible exporter of nuclear technology. We have ANSTO, our nuclear sciences and technology organisation, where we of course have that research reactor generate... Well, well just on yes, that, yeah. do, do you think Australians, would you like to guess how a percentage of Australians actually know that we already have a reactor? Oh, it would be very low. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can guess a percentage. Yeah. Well, um, just I, don't, I think so this room would be a bit different. Well, they don't um, seem to, I think Australians <laughs> don't seem to know at all. I, I don't think, I don't think, I, I'd say most don't. If you're not in Sydney, if you're not, uh, and even I imagine people in Sydney don't realise the fact, but 30 kilometres away from the Sydney CBD, there's been research uh, nuclear reactors operating safely for around seven decades. And, and it's not allowed to generate it's electricity? Not, well, it ge generates 20 megawatts, but it's not, you're not allowed to produce any, well, you're not allowed to, I guess, build another but, reactor. But is it true they're not allowed to sell it into the grid? I think uh, I read I, that I would once. imagine that's true. Yeah. I'd imagine that's true. So I, I guess that's another contradiction. But Australia already does have a nuclear industry. Uh, we, we, of course, have that research reactor. We are actually renowned around the world for managing you know, intermediate and low-level nuclear waste. We've got multiple innovations in this scene. We, we have the nuclear expertise, there are around 400 PhDs at Lucas Heights at ANSTO, uh, nuclear scientists who... So I, I, I think the, the, point, the point I'd be trying to make is that Australia has all of the potential. You know, we have the uranium, we have the largest reserves of uranium in the world, we have the technical expertise, we've got the people. There are many people in Australia who have been instrumental uh, if you think of, you know, A.D. Patterson, the former CEO of ANSTO, Stephen Wilson, uh, even Helen Cook, who's one of the most prominent lawyers when it comes to nuclear energy around the world. We've got the people, we've got the uranium, we've got the expertise, we've got the experience when it comes to Lucas Heights uh, to be a real nuclear superpower and at least help other countries reach their potential of net zero, which is, you know, if it doesn't work in Australia, uh, at least the government's acknowledged like in that letter response that I got, that at least at least nuclear would work in other countries. So if, if that's the case, that they believe that nuclear energy would work in other countries, surely considering the potential we have, that we would, you know, consider being a good global citizen and help them out reach net zero, because the last thing about, about that is if we want to actually have an impact on the climate, well, let's be honest, Australia's probably not going to have much of an impact if we're just transitioning all of our energy generation, the real impact comes from helping other countries reach net zero. And when we've got all the conditions in place to be a nuclear superpower, surely we should realise that and capitalise on that and help other countries uh, in that fight. Okay, so we haven't covered the two really hoary chestnuts, of course, <coughs> uh, that always get thrown up. But interestingly, less so these days, you don't often hear it said. So the, the first one is, what about the waste? And the other one is the scary one about weapons proliferation. Mm. What, are you, what are your thoughts on those two, two things? Uh, I'll separate my answers because I, I think, as people can imagine, I have a tendency to waffle a bit. Um, no, no, not but, at all. Um, I, I, I can do much better than you with that. Right? Um, in, terms of, in terms of nuclear waste, so it's important to, first of all, realise that there's three types of nuclear waste and they're ranked basically on their radioactivity and also their volume. So there's low level uh, nuclear waste, which is the least radioactive and makes up the highest volume 
of waste. I'm sorry, I can't actually remember those statistics at the moment, but people can search it up if they want. Then there comes intermediate nuclear waste, which is the next level of radioactivity and is less volume as a result. And then the final level is high level waste. Now, this is the waste that Australia's never managed. We've had to manage the low and intermediate waste as, as a result of our research reactor and also our production of nuclear medicines, which you know, many people in Australia have benefited from. And we managed that at you know, Lucas Heights and I think around 100 locations around Australia, including you know, in hospitals and stuff. So there's that aspect of it. Australia's able to manage it. There are multiple things going on in that scene as well. The difference here is the high level waste and that's what people fear because it, it, it's basically the spent fuel which is produced out of those uh, civil nuclear power reactors or indeed the small modular reactors in the submarines. In terms of how that's managed, the first thing that's important to point out is that the nuclear industry is the only industry which is able to manage its waste. Because when you look to renewables, where does the waste from solar panels, wind turbines ends up? Well, most of the times it ends up in landfill. Of course, it's good that there's innovations in terms of recycling in this space, but in reality, the majority of, of them end up in landfill. And that's, of course, a terrible thing, especially when you consider the volume of wind turbines and solar panels because of the, uh, their energy density. Um, and then you consider fossil fuels. Where does the waste from fossil fuels end up? Well, it's put into our atmosphere every day and we have to breathe it in every day. And that has real health consequences for us. The difference with nuclear energy is it can be safely managed. Uh, sorry, high-level nuclear waste, it can be safely managed. In most cases around the world, what that looks like is the spent fuel, once it's left the reactor, is initially put into a, uh, a pool of water, a cooling pool on the site of that reactor to uh, basically cool down after it's been used um, and then it will end up in a concrete canister or, or something of the like before there's the prospect of it being put into underground repository. The really significant thing though is that nuclear waste can actually be recycled or reprocessed. So it's not that high level waste is not necessarily waste until it's uh, actually wasted because it's, it's really just spent fuel and once it is initially used in the reactor, it still retains uh, the majority of its energy. So it's, been, so it's actually able to be recycled using certain technologies. Admittedly, that's not being done much around the world, but nuclear waste is actually a beneficial thing. It's an, it, there's a lot of untapped potential when it comes to nuclear waste, especially if we're facing the prospect of our terrestrial uh, uranium supplies running out. The final thing I'd say about waste is that the, 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 this issue is really a small issue and I made this point on Q&A because the volume of high level waste, obviously when you think of the three levels of, of nuclear waste, it's the smallest volume. The volume of high level waste produced around the world is incredibly small. In fact, if you were to add up all of the high level waste or spent fuel from around the world since the start of nuclear energy, it would actually easily fit inside a, a stadium. It's, it's that small of an issue we're talking about. And in regards to the waste that would be produced to power a person for a whole year entirely from nuclear, it would be about the size of a Coke can or maybe like the glasses that people have today. So it's incredibly small volume of waste. And when you compare that to, you know, how many solar panels would be required to power you for, for your whole lifetime, how many times they have to be replaced, you know, that's probably a much bigger issue. Um, do you want me to transition on well, to the well, second? Just, I, oh, yeah, I just wanted to throw back, I did yeah, mention yeah. Finland earlier on, because yeah. have you been following that? They've the just done a, a very big yeah. underground, did, did, you, did you want to provide any comments on, on that facility? Do you know well, much about it? I, my, my knowledge of that is limited, but Finland's basically, from my understanding, one of the first countries to actually have an underground repository site, because there's been many nations around the world who've tried to do this. I think even Australia's had it once was contemplating the idea of, I heard this a few days ago, storing all of the world's high level waste. But due to, well, uh, the environmental lobbies, uh, that's, those efforts have often been blocked. In regards to what Finland's doing, so they're, uh, once, once they, you know, once that high level waste spent fuel is produced, their idea now is once, when they, after they put it in those concrete canisters, that they can then place those concrete canisters in that underground repository uh, to be safely stored so it can, so uh, that high level waste can naturally lose its radioactivity over time. But I 
I'm not sure exactly, but I think there is the prospect for those canisters to be extracted to for so if there is ever the chance or whether it, when it is viable uh, for that high level waste spent fuel to be reprocessed or recycled, uh, they can just extract it and use it then. Um, that's, that's my understanding. But okay, let's talk yeah. weapons then. then. Surely this will just lead to uh, proliferation of, of nuclear weapons and you know, if you've got nuclear subs, surely you need nuclear weapons to go with them. I mean, isn't, isn't that the natural progression? Aren't we on the slippery slope? And I say that, I, 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 in this audience they'll forget that I'm joking, but mm. that was the argument when I was your age in the 1970s and when people threw a brick through our window the anti-nuclear uh, yeah. protesters in, in, in Launceston, Tasmania back in 78, or I think it was, or mm. 77, where Dad literally was Minister for National Development and the range of uranium mine was being considered. It was, that was the argument. So what, what do you say to that? Yeah, sh is this the slippery slope? Yeah, uh, well, the first thing to say is civil nuclear power is, is, not, is not the same as nuclear weapons. And is it, the main reason for that is the enrichment level of uranium is just so drastically different when you compare civil nuclear power reactors to uh, nuclear weapons. It's something like around three to five percent from my understanding for civil nuclear power reactors it can be greater um, compared to around 90 percent for nuclear weapons. But then if you compare it to the Orca submarines the enrichment levels of the uranium for that is about 20 percent. So if you're thinking about non-proliferation it's probably a greater risk with the Orca submarines and accepting those, something that government's accepted, um, then the advent of civil nuclear power reactors. The other thing is to say, of course, that Australia has very, very strong regulation, regulations and commitments to you know, international treaties and the non-proliferation space. But I don't think that we, sh we should assume that a civil nuclear power reactors would immediately mean that Australia would get nuclear weapons, because I, I know surely there would be a huge public pushback, at least, from that. So, uh, I, I don't think that's a reasonable next step, and at least not a next step that I would want to see. Um, and I would, I would certainly, if we saw nuclear power being introduced, uh, I would certainly make my voice heard on why I wouldn't want that then to lead to uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so it's really, really, at the end of the day, it's you know, it's just like it's governments can make any decisions, and that's a yeah. decision. That, that shouldn't well, be made. I mean, well, yeah, there's, yeah. there's not that natural pathway. If the government really wanted nuclear weapons, well, we've got the uranium. They could set up some some enrichment facilities if they wanted. Like, it doesn't yeah. make too much sense. Oh. And the fact is, well, I know there's regulations, but there is no reason why, or well, there, are, there are reasons, but, um, you know, our uranium could potentially be going to uh, international actors which are producing nuclear weapons. I, I know there's frameworks in place, but you know, uh, the fact that Australia has abundant uranium reserves and hasn't actually uh, developed any nuclear weapons now, I think is a pretty good indication that yeah, that absolutely. wouldn't be a possibility. Uh, so look, I I'm going to open it to the floor in a sec, but just one sort of question before we do that, and then we'll come back at the end of some wind up things. But uh, so ladies and gentlemen, get thinking, and I've got a few questions that have already been provided from the floor. but. Um, we'll just be ultra political right now, like because this is a political issue. So we know that the Prime Minister and Chris Bowen are against it um, and continue to, to hold that line. Uh, it's like this ongoing, you're there saying and others are saying, mm -hmm. remove the ban and the response is, it doesn't stack up. No, I didn't say that. I said, get rid of the ban. No, it doesn't stack up. So we've got where they're coming from. So what sort of political support have you had out there? What are you seeing? Yeah. Like, for example, I think that the, 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 the uh, environmental, uh, oh, yeah. the, the green uh, uh, Zion, what's her oh, name? Zion, Zion Lights, Zion, yeah. Zion Lights, for yeah. example, is one of the more enlightened yes. people in the green movement. Have you seen that in the Greens political party or yeah. in the, the green groups in Australia? And what about other parts of the Labor Party or the, or the union movement? Yeah. I think I'd preface what I'd say is by making it really clear that I'm not a member of any political party. My campaign, Nuclear for Australia, is not associated with any political party because I have the really firm belief that this should be a, a bipartisan issue. And my whole aim is to basically bring those parties on board which and those people from certain ideologies which oppose nuclear energy to come around to the idea of uh, nuclear energy. In terms of the response I'm seeing, you know, like obviously the uh, the Liberal Party is putting a policy forward for nuclear energy and uh, 
in terms, I think that obviously part of that will be the ban being lifted and then the second part of that actually building nuclear reactors. Uh, starting with the Liberal Party, uh, my question is why they didn't do anything for it in the decade that they were in well, government. Well, you made the point about the ban of the EPCA. Oh, well, and it was under the Howard government that yeah. that was done, and I know he tried to backtrack that, and I think around the, uh, that report um, in, in around 2007. But the fact is the Liberal Party aren't doing a really great job on this issue at, at the moment. So I'm not... When people, when people come to the assumption, and, you know, they obviously do on Twitter, oh, look at, look at this uh, young Liberal being, you know, this kid being groomed by a Liberal Party. It doesn't... It, just doesn't really stack up when you think about it because the Liberal Party's had a lot of potential to do change things when it comes to nuclear energy but they've decided to do nothing on it uh, up until this point. At least the AUKUS announcement is a good thing that you know the Liberal Party presided over which could hopefully lead to a civil nuclear power industry being considered in Australia. In regards to the response I'm seeing from people who would traditionally oppose nuclear, obviously overseas there's examples like Zion, which you point out. She, for people who aren't aware of Zion Lights, is a former member of Extinction Rebellion who decided to actually leave that organisation because she really strongly believed in nuclear energy and she was actually uh, getting, uh, well, her views were getting suppressed. She was, uh, she was really ostracised from that organisation when she started talking in favour of nuclear. She's now doing her own thing. There are uh, there are many political parties around the world, you know, U UK Labor who support nuclear energy, the Democrats in the United States, the Finnish Greens Party. So there's that international element where nuclear is actually a uniting issue and it's not actually seen through. So, so is that a lever that you did intend to deploy to try and get well, people it has, to see, it, see this in Australia? Uh, well, yeah, I am doing that and I've done a bit of it on social media. So I've talked to Zion, I've talked to one of the members of the Finnish Greens and I, the format of that is basically a live Q and A across uh, my social media channels, just to basically show people that, uh, especially people who are form of a part of those parties which I guess would traditionally oppose nuclear, that you know their their counterparts overseas actually see the potential in nuclear, and I think that's really important. Uh, I think if I then bring it back to Australia and the traction I'm seeing, I I think it's unfortunate that there is a Prime Minister and also an Energy Minister who, from my understanding, have a deeply rooted historical opposition to nuclear and my understanding is that they were involved in anti-nuclear protests. They could have had something to do with that brick I was talking about before. That's, that's, I, I don't mean you, Prime Minister, or you, Chris Barn. I'm just merely <laughs> suggesting that people you associated with threw the brick. But Yeah, yeah I, I think it's disappointing and I can understand if you have... Um, uh, such a historical position yeah. and such an emotional position like that, it it's, would be really hard to change your position, especially when you consider the context that they were in uh, and the, the information that they were probably being exposed to at that time. Uh, I'll leave that point basically just to say that there are certainly people from across politics who privately support nuclear energy. I, I, I won't say too much, but you know, there are people in the Greens Party who support nuclear energy. That's, that's just a fact. Um, but currently, due to their party's position, it makes sense why they're not saying anything about it. There are people in the Labor Party, I think the most oh, prominent example is Peter, Peter, uh, Peter Malinowskis, who uh, I... The AWU. The AWU. Yeah, yeah, the Australian the Workers, Workers Union, yeah. Yeah. Um, who very uh, publicly actually support nuclear energy. So. I, I hope the tide is turning. I hope more politicians come, come out in favour of nuclear energy, especially when they realise that their voters actually support nuclear energy. The only evidence that we have that Australians either support or don't support nuclear currently is the polls, but every single poll indicates that a majority of Australians not only support lifting the ban on nuclear energy, but actually support building reactors nuclear reactors in this country. Which That's I, really easy. Can you get, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's not like... An, an so that makes maybe more easy than, than they think. Well, it yeah, and it was even apparent on that episode of q and I was on with Chris Bowen, where I, I think there was the other panellists were quite shocked to see when the, when the Q&A ABC audience was prompted with the question, should nuclear energy be legalised in Australia, 59% uh, came back and said yes. And there was a, in a Q&A &A audience? Yes. Outstanding. And in, <laughs> and in the past, there's even a... 
Mm. There's even a better example of that where in a, in a poll there was a, there's an episode and it was in, hosted in Newcastle which obviously is, uh, has an uh, important relationship with our country's energy transition. Um, but in that episode they asked whether people would support basically building reactors and I think something like 63% came back and said yes and that was 20,000 of their viewers came back and said yes. So it's quite, it, it's quite astounding the level of support there is in the public for nuclear energy and uh, I, I just hope that that would provoke some politicians to realise that their anti-nuclear position is not only out of date but out of touch with the Australian public and with their constituents. Fantastic, well done. So our, our first question from Forbes I've got here up, up with me is, uh, it's basically a personal one and mm. it sort of leads on from what you are just talking about, like has this taken a personal toll? I'm paraphrasing uh, the person's <laughs> question, but has, has this been tough? Have you made new friends or have you got a lot of enemies on social media? <laughs> Um, okay, I think Dad has a very good understanding of this. Um, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, whilst I've been overwhelmed with the level of support I've received, when you come out and advocate for what is a really emotional issue, uh, obviously there's going to be quite the response. And I, you know, you try to ignore it on social media, but there are obviously people who go after you, make assumptions about you, uh, and you know, especially after Q&A, that, that, that's not easy. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's sad, it, it, it is sad when you, you think about it uh, a bit more and to consider the fact that there are so many people who are willing to, you know, abuse you uh, from the cover of their screen on things like Twitter. And I, if, if people go on Twitter and search up my name, they can probably see what I'm talking about right now. Uh, but I... I'd say I'm pretty resilient in terms of that, like well, I cop well, that's, it. That's good on you. I cop because it. Because I'm um, sure there's been pylons and that. There yeah. has. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think the good thing for me is just realising that there is, you know, the majority of Australians support what I'm saying. Uh, there is a minority of Australians who are, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's the fact that they're personally invested in the renewable-centric approach our government is currently following, that they choose to target me. Uh, probably seeing me as an easy target, but I, I would say that that only really gives me more conviction. Um, on, yeah. Which is, yeah. So, is there a question from the floor? I've got some other ones that have been up, but just down here. So, um, Will, do you have an opinion on why Chris Bowen is so against nuclear? I, I don't really understand. I, I don't understand it either. Um, uh, and I'm not sure how much I can say in relation to that question because. I think, um, obviously, my understanding is he was involved in protests in the past. I think the broad assessment I'd make is I don't want to make assumptions about Chris Bond because, to be honest, I don't actually think it's that easy for a politician to defend an anti-nuclear position in this day and age when the majority of Australians are against them and the science is clearly against them. But uh, I think it's, this is probably just a remnant of the climate wars. Uh, over time, you know, whether it's Liberal Party from my own personal perception or Labor Party, uh, there's really been a tunnel visioned approach to energy policy where they're only really able to consider with it's the Liberal Party, probably mostly fossil fuels, or the Labor Party, uh, they can only realise the potential of a, a renewable, 100% renewable grid. So I think the issue for Chris Bowen at this moment is even if he changes his mind, he's the government is so invested in this 100% renewable pathway that it would be really, really difficult to turn back from that. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure what would trigger him to change his views on that. But I, I certainly hope that he does. And hopefully, if, uh, if if he can see the momentum behind this issue, especially from Australians, uh, hopefully that will force him to change his mind. On six. <laughs> what are you planning to do when you leave school? Oh, that was oh, my no, question. No. You're out of, all, you're out of <laughs> order. <laughs> no. I've had this question a few times and it was, it was funny. On the morning of my Senate evidence, I was asked this on sunrise. and was, I never really... Had, you know, we, we're obviously told in school to consider this question and I was asked by Natalie Barr 
what do you plan to do? And I, I wasn't prepared for that, so I, you know, of course, returned back to the nuclear talking points. Uh, the fact is, I'm not going to say I'm distracted by nuclear energy at the moment. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know uh, what I want to do. I think this experience has certainly changed my views. Whether or not it's something to do with nuclear energy, I'm not sure, because that's really relying on the government changing their ways and actually producing, uh, making the potential for people like me interested in nuclear energy to actually work in the industry or around the industry in Australia because currently besides from ANSTO there really isn't much of a potential for people like me to do that which is I think a real shame. Currently you need to go overseas if you're interested in nuclear sciences but uh, what I would say is like my views on energy policy I'm just keeping all options on the table. Steve Baxter? It's um, um, you, you mentioned before people employed at the Newcastle. Mm. Like most confronted by the energy transition. Mm. That's people are about to lose their jobs. Yeah. How do we lose the euphemism and be real about what this is about? Is this about community? Is this about cost? Is this about economy? I, I, I would mm. say what you said. Yeah, that yeah. was quite hell of a euphemism. Yeah. No, I, I get that and I think it's I, I don't like the fact that I am commenting on this when, you know, I live in inner city Brisbane where, you know, we have nothing really to do with the energy transition. And I think it was a, it was a really eye-opening experience for me going to Manizer a, a few weeks ago to, because they're obviously, you know, they're a, they're a community which is interested in nuclear energy to just talk to the people on the ground there and to you know, gain their perspective on things. I, I, I don't know what I can do to, well, there's obviously a bit I can do to, you know, get past some of those euphemisms. I think it takes, uh, I'm hoping that people, and we're, we're starting to see this, people in regional communities taking it into their own hands and advocating, uh, whether it's, you know, against the transmission projects and hopefully for nuclear reactors. I don't, what I would say is it's probably not my role. I don't see it as my role to, to comment on what's best for regional communities. Um, and I think, I don't think it would be really sincere for me to pretend I understand the issues uh, for the communities which are going to uh, bear the brunt with this energy transition. So I think, you know, it's it, Desai here is from, he's helping me, he's from uh, around Toowoomba and stuff. So I'm working with other young people and I, I hope that there can be some regional voices which, uh, you know, e even if they overshadow mine, come out and, and discuss these issues to make it really clear to Australians that, uh, that there are huge challenges presented by net zero for them. I, I hope that was an adequate Jane? answer to your question. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Tony, congratulations on your success. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> From your appearance in the Senate on Q&A, yeah. uh, social media, uh, what do you sense it's going to take, what's it going to take to overturn the ban? Blackout. Yeah, I said that earlier today. Unfortunately, I think blackouts. Um, and I think that's what most people uh, probably understand because, you know, it's even with young people. I think from my experiences talking to young people, yes, they get the... Uh, the urgency with the climate crisis, but they probably don't understand to the same extent as many other people the concerns with the energy crisis because you know the lights don't really go, haven't gone out for them, and they haven't really, at least in the city, realised uh, just how important energy security really is. Uh, so in that context, I think you know young people from. I, I'll, I'll bring it back to young people because I think that young people come from a blank slate. Uh, when considering nuclear energy, they're willing to be open to it because they haven't been exposed to the same misinformation and propaganda about it. So they're open to the idea, but they're not, from my experience, unfortunately, young people aren't passionate about it because they still believe that renewables alone could power the grid. Uh, they don't see the necessity for nuclear energy, which is a huge problem. So, and that probably extends to the rest of society. They, there's sort of a belief that re renewal, all we need to do is just invest in renewables. So until it's proven that renewables themselves cannot do the job, whether that is because of, unfortunately, 
blackouts or load shedding in Australia and you know AEMO is predicting that in some areas even as early as the end of this year in Victoria and South Australia. Whether it's that happening in Australia or even around the world if there is a uh, it, it could even take something like Germany having to reverse their anti-nuclear position because, you know, it, it's, it's quite surprising when I see pictures of our, you know, our Queensland Energy Minister and Chris Bowen posing with the German Energy Minister. It shocks me that they're willing to do that when you look to Germany, they've shut down all of their nuclear reactors and they're now opening up coal-fired power stations. So maybe it will take a country like Germany to reverse their position. Uh, for people in Australia and also politicians to realise that it's probably not a safe bet to just rely on renewables. I think uh, we're going to have to start to wrap this up, but let's just take one more. Hi, Will. Um, even older than most of the people in this room was the understanding that Australians came from a group, you know, the stump jump flowers. Mm. We could figure it out. We were the can. Australians. Thank you for reminding us of your philosophy, your intelligence, your spread of information, and when can we vote for you? <laughs> oh, well, no, that's too well, generous. <laughs> I appreciate so, so, that. So, we'll more pointedly, um, yeah. you're, you're not going to go into politics, no, are you really? No, um, but I don't want to rule anything out. But, yeah, oh, um, no, 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 no. no. Um, no, um, no, but um, no, I don't want to. I don't want to. Well, no, um, no, because currently I see the failure of politicians, and obviously I'm a bit dismayed by that. But I think the point is that, you know, I really, from a personal principle perspective, as a young person, I just don't understand why our politicians are so pessimistic about the future of Australian Australia's capabilities. Like, why does Australia? Why, why is Australia not able? to you know produce nuclear react to build nuclear reactors why isn't australia able to you know potentially lead the way when it comes to nuclear safety and be a shining example for the rest of the world why can't we have that vision and why do we have to restrict that with a ban that doesn't really make sense to me surely we should be a bit more ambitious for our country and you know start to look around and realize like i said earlier that we have all the prerequisites in place for nuclear energy it, all it takes is, you know, a single decision really to just lift the ban and to, you know, obviously there's steps after that. But um, we should be an ambitious nation, and currently I think the yeah the, the, the nuclear policy I think currently just shows the pessimism of politicians towards Australia and our capabilities uh, when it comes to nuclear and also uh, solving the energy and climate crisis. Well, Will, it's been a, an absolute pleasure to have a conversation you. with you here this afternoon. I know everyone has really enjoyed it. So my, my work now is done and I'll, I'll hand back to yes. Ryan Young. So thank you for no, the opportunity you. to have a chat. Thank you.